what I want to do today is um, challenge our presumptions about um, megaliths, shaman and city builders and explain what the connections are between cities and city builders and why they are hidden. And what I'm going to do is take you on a journey right back to the end of the Ice Age and give you an alternative interpretation of how living in cities came about, in particular by exploring these links between megaliths, shaman and city builders. And I'm going to present you with some surprising evidence from an unusual source that I think confirms these links. The first point to make is that we do not normally link megaliths, shaman with city builders. Indeed, there are no ancient cities associated with either Stonehenge or Avebury. If you mention megalith to anyone in Britain, these are normally the images that spring to mind, Stonehenge and Avebury. And if you say shaman, this is what people normally think of. I mean, some of the pictures in Peter Knight's um, interpretation. We think of primitive past, we think of nature, nature spirits, sacred groves of oak trees, landscape te temples, zodiacs, rock springs, we think druids, Stonehenge, we think of John Michel, um, but we do not think of this, and we, nor do we think of this. And yet they are all linked. And one reason we do not make these connections is because of these people, the Romans. They have dominated our way of thinking, and um, and we see everything through their mindsets. This may sound bizarre, but it's through the Greeks and Romans that we understand as much as we do about the past, but they also form a barrier because they themselves did not understand um, about the times they were living in. And in fact, they were quite capable of getting it wrong because in particular, they did not understand these people, the Egyptians, in spite of living them, with them for several years, hundreds of years. The Greeks of all the Indo-European tribes were those who were closest to the Egyptians, and it is mostly through the Greeks that we know as much as we do so you're getting, you're getting the point that our normal way of thinking about things, shamans, is all wild, wild and woolly, and that you don't think of pharaohs when we think of shaman, and you don't think of cities when we think of them, and you don't realise that it's because of the Romans and the fact that they form this barrier. But we understand most of what we understand about the ancient past through the Romans and the Greeks because we have inherited their languages, but we've also inherited their mindsets, their way of thinking about things, and that they didn't understand... The, the Egyptians in particular. <clears throat> the Greeks, um, above all the Indian European tribes, spent the most time with the Egyptians. They were the closest to them. But at the end of the 4th century AD, even certain possibilities of communicating with the Egyptians disappeared as we lost the ability to understand hieroglyphs. <clears throat> and what we have not appreciated as a result of um, this break with the ancient past is the influence of the Egyptians and the others in the development of cities. And we've remained largely ignorant of their role and their connections with megaliths and shaman. And in order to understand what that role is, I'm going to take us right back to the beginning, back to the end of the Ice Age. Now, this, this chart, what this chart shows is the dotted line, obviously, is the extent of the ice. This line down here is the lower sea levels, because obviously when there was lots of ice, that absorbed a lot of water, so the sea level was actually lower. The clans you can read about in, in my book, I've taken them from um, Professor Brian Sykes' work on genetics, and these go back thousands, 45,000 years and, and more. And the story that we, we, we tell ourselves is it all starts with a farming experiment, and you can read about that in the British Museum. The Paleolithic man, instead of sitting in his cave, he starts throwing some seeds around, he realises he has a surplus, and being clever, he decides to exchange it, for something else, and suddenly we're on our way we're on our, um, to becoming civilised and living in towns and cities with them growing out of any marketplaces. And um, with the help of the Greeks and Romans, we then became extremely civilised. And lots of people continue to believe that. But once you start to challenge the accepted story, something different emerges from the same archaeological record, and other possibilities appear. And what I mean is that our misinterpretation of how human progress has come about has in itself obscured a deeper, more important story, one that has not been helped by a misunderstanding of the Egyptians and other ancient cultures. And I think it is only by going back into prehistory, before the Egyptians, that we can get a clearer picture and realise that it is we who are primitive pagan, well, pagan in the nicest sense, and backwards. In particular, the common view that the path to human progress was all luck, happy chance, um, does not allow for the possibility that some of our story could be the result of deliberate manipulation by a powerful elite. Um, Jacqueta Hortz, who's a well-known um, writer, though she's now dead, 
is one of the few to draw attention to this curious situation in her comment that civilization was not inevitable. For on the one hand, men have lived on well-watered and fertile land without creating civilization, and on the other hand, they have created civilizations in apparently poor environments. And she's not, she's not alone in her comments. Charles Maisel, he, he talks about a site here in the upper, upper Zab, um, which he describes as a zone of rocky limestone hillocks, not really suitable for farming, he says, yet there's plenty of evidence for it here. And it is also in the Golden Crescent that we have the remains of a series of well-built settlements dating to times between the 10th and 8th millennium um, BC, the most famous being at um, Chatelhuic, which is down here. And I'm not going to talk about Gebelki, Gebelki Tepe here. Um, that's for other people to discuss. It's also a very interesting and ancient site, not, not far from, from this area. Uh, this is a reconstruction of Chatelhuic, and it's something else that's hailed as mankind being on its way to civilised life. And what is significant about Chatelhuic is that the central feature of the settlement are well-constructed storerooms, which are better built than the human dwellings around them. This is a plan of the whole thing. It's all very strictly laid out. All the houses are built to the same ground plan. It, it's um, it's um, something that you would think was, was the beginning. It doesn't grow into a city. Nothing else comes out of this. And the diet is resolutely Stone Age. It consists of wild animals, owl rocks, and, and such like. So a contradiction of the idea that markets leads to towns, leads to, to cities. And here in the Golden Crescent, we have the evidence of the earliest farming, the earliest metalwork, pottery, not civilization as such, but what we might describe as the fingerprints of civilizers. So what were they doing in mountains? I'll come back to this later because it's a very important point. Suddenly, in around the 5000 BC, in what is referred to as early Bronze Age, the first cities start to appear in southern Iraq, which is down here. <clears throat> about as far away from mountains as is possible in this part of the world. One of the oldest of the cities, not on this map, but it's about there. Eridu has a shrine dating to 2000 BC that has 17 layers underneath it that possibly go back as far as, far as 5000 BC. By 3600 BC, Uruk, for example, had become a great city with over 10,000 people. This is what Uruk looks like today, pile of stones. Um, the much later epic of Gilgamesh refers to the quartering of the city with the great temple of Ishtar in one quarter. And we know that these are cities because they have recognisable infrastructure, evidence of activities like administration, record keeping, that kind of thing. Skills that are not innate. We only have to look at our own modern difficulties with teaching well-known civilised skills like writing to know that even after thousands of years, these skills have to be taught. But the key thing that happens at about this time is what the archaeologists refer to as the secondary products revolution. I mean, this is an extraordinary coincidence. Uh, <clears throat> and what the secondary products revolution in agriculture refers to is a time when all of a sudden we can take milk from a cow and make butter cheese, the secondary products. We can plow, ride a horse, take wool from a sheep, plant vines, so forth. The kind of farming that we would all recognize because the earlier farming that happened, apart from the domestication of cereals, was about meat and hides. Our wild animals were penned up for meat and hides, and that was all. You couldn't actually do any of this later stuff. Um, I mean, the most extraordinary thing about the wool from a sheep is you couldn't do this before because a sheep was not sufficiently modified. Sheep had coats like deer. Uh, even though there's evidence going back to 10,500 BC of people eating them, you couldn't actually use their coats. They didn't have wool. Uh, and so just how odd and how convenient that just when people start to live in cities um, that, they, uh, that they go in for all this organized farming. And this shift had to be deliberate because no self-respecting hunter-gatherer would A, give up providing for himself and his family to live in a city until he could be sure that he could rely on someone else, and B, that he had a skill that would be useful in a city. Um, <clears throat> And so there we have modern farming uh, <coughs> as, as we would recognize it. And the most notable point about this is that people did not make this transition first from nomadic hunter-gatherer. You'd think that it'd be easy to go to nomadic pastures with sheep and all the rest of it. The shift in Bronze Age farming always involved a settled pattern first, usually identified by the presence of pigs, which cannot be herded long distance. And if you take the example of modern-day uh, Central Asia, Fergana Valley, which is right in, in the eastern part of Uzbekistan, the Kyrgyz tribes, they, they herd their massive flocks of sheep over long distances up into the hills.